Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, we'd like to thank you, the HRI committee, for inviting us, for letting us speaking today. Thank you for me as a, um, an attendee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this side this time. Uh, and we, I come from Brussels. He comes from Strasbourg. So and we are against Homeo Exit. <laughs> 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 yes. So it's not Homeo Exit. <laughs> it's <laughs> homeopathy. Strasbourg, capital of Europe. Europe. Bruxelles is the second one, capital no, of Europe. No, that's a debate. Yes. But, uh, and, and so now we are going to jump into more clinical practice. We leave the science, we go into our clinical practice. And um, first of all, because there has been a major step in the cancer field last summer, last July, at the ASCO. ASCO stands for American Society of Clinical Oncology last summer. Every uh, beginning of July they meet and it's the 3,500 people around in the oncology world and they decide what is good and what is bad about cancer care for all over the world. And last uh, July it was a, really a surprise because the ASCO expert panel decided that the recommendations of the SIO, Society of Integrative Oncology, the guidelines which were published in 2017, were based on the most relevant scientific evidence and the ASCO endorsed those guidelines. So that was a big step because it, it has to do what is integrative oncology. Well, integrative oncology is a patient-centered evidence-informed field on cancer care. So it's part of the conventional cancer care now, thanks to this ASCO uh, recommendation, that utilizes mind and body practices, natural products, and lifestyle modification from different traditions alongside conventional cancer treatment. And that's what we do as homeopath. We help the patient alongside his conventional treatment to become an active participant and be, uh, have along all during the cancer continuum, have a better quality of life for the whole treatment. Okay, why? Because this is a clinical reality. The clinical reality is up that 60% of cancer patients do use complementary medicine during the treatment. And we also know that the prevalence and the choice of the complementary medicine is geographically and culturally related. The next step is that homeopathy is the first complementary medicine in France and in Belgium. So I want to present you now just uh, a study that we, we did in Strasbourg, and it was a study of uh, 535 patients during chemotherapy. And we asked to them if they use complementary medicine or if they use which kind of com complementary medicine. And um, we see that it was in four anti-cancer anti centers in Strasbourg. And uh, you see the most used of complementary medicine in France uh, was, is homeopathy. Yeah. It's very important because if you see the second medical therapy that is uh, acupuncture, it's only 16 persons, when homeopathy is 65 persons. So it's very important results. And uh, among all the patients, it was 30 percent using homeopathy for supportive care. It's a very important result. And in France, you see, there is a very good dialogue be between the homeopathic doctors and patient and oncologist, because you have 82 percent. When in USA, it's only 20, 25 percent. You see the difference. So you have to, it's very important because you have, can't interpret uh, the study in the United States. It's not the same that in France. And these this results are very interesting because you see the most important symptom in oncology is fatigue. And you see that fatigue is a symptom where the patient wears the most uh, um, improving. improving with homeopathy. It's very interesting. And you see, you have pain is the second one. And everybody says homeopathy is not for the pain in oncology. Yes, it's a very good indication. And you have sadness, anxiety, insomnia, and some, some symptoms for you have no answer in conventional medicine, like dry mouth. 
Every, it's the fourth symptom in, in, in oncology, dry mouth. And you have no answer in a conventional therapy. So homeopathy is a very good indication in this case. So last, in December 2016, before ASCO decided that complementary medicine has a major role in cancer care patients, we have founded uh, the International Homeopathic Society of Supportive Care in Oncology. And the aim of this, uh, this uh, scientific society was developing the practice, the teaching, the research in the homeopathic treatment alongside with cancer treatment as a supportive medication. The goals, the goals were improving our practice, our homeopathic practice, by recommendations specific to the field of oncology, respecting what is our, our, our core nature, which is individualization and infinitesimality. And of course, we wanted that all health professionals involved in cancer care had an homeopathic prescription tool which would be easy to implement in all the clinical settings, as well as the hospital, the family practice, all the people around uh, the cancer uh, patient. So why would we like to have good practice recommendations? Good practice recommendations, it's also what is done in the conventional medicine, because then we could unify and optimize our homeopathic practice. Because homeopathy is, in practical, is a bit, everyone has his own way of working, so we wanted to have something that optimizes and unifies our practices with the aim of improving quality, uh, patients' quality of life, and of course, the safety of supportive cancer care. So those are the three reasons why we wanted to have good practice recommendations in, a, in order um, related to homeopathic treatment during cancer care. We use the a methodology, which Jean Lionel is going to explain, the yes. French methodology. Yes, because we have not enough, um, enough um, research uh, in uh, supportive care in homeopathy. So we can take uh, many papers here and here to say that's the better thing to do is to, 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 to give this treatment. No, so we have to do a uh, formal consensus, which is uh, proposed by the French Eye Health Authority. When you have not enough um, acid... Uh, when you don't have enough data, enough scientific data, yes. the French... Um, High authority proposed a method to gather experts together and to make a, a, a consensus, a formal consensus. So we did a pre-congress uh, with uh, uh, experts. Every kind of every kind of uh, problem we with different e experts. Then, during the congress, they expose their results, and we uh, we try to. Yeah. So, so I, I'm going a little backwards, if, if you don't mind. So the, 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 the methodology was seven steering groups, which was prepared the recommendation based on what was there out in the literature. And then we had a discussion, a group discussion. And then after that, we decided, we voted. It was very democratic procedure. We voted our recommendations. So this is the bibliographic data that we gathered, that the experts they, uh, gathered. Those are the seven groups, which is alongside the, the, patient's, um, uh, the, the, the patient's path, the cancer, pa the cancer path, so disclosure, surgery, chemotherapy, targeted therapies, radiation therapy, hormone therapies, and post-cancer period, which are specific moments during cancer care where they come and see an homeopath for support group. So we wanted to do recommendations related to those steps of cancer treatment. And this is the picture where we, um, uh, the, the Congress, where we are all together discussing, and this was the first time we had such an approach. And it was, very, it was a very nice experience because we were 15 in a room, pharmacist, homeopath, Super, uh, super, uh, specialized in supportive care, oncologists, and cancer surgeons. And we, from the beginning, we want to do, add in our discussion the pharmacists because in cash, in, uh, cancer patients go to their pharmacists and ask, do you have something for my side effects? Or so they were, right from the beginning, part of the discussion. And that was also very nice 
because in the same room we had classical homeopathy, anthroposophy, and clinical homeopathy. So we all together, we spoke the same language to manage, to build up those guidelines. And so we discussed, it was really strong discussion, and we came out with 30 recommendations. After, uh, really, was the democratic procedure, we unanimously, we had elections, adopted the recommendations. But the problem of homeopathy, it's a problem of key. <laughs> we had the afternoon explaining <laughs> that, <laughs> that we should. We, ha we have to find the good key, and uh, we, we have to individualize, individualize the treatment. So if you don't do it, it's not homeopathy. And uh, Dr. Matti uh, show, show you this morning that, that if you don't do individualize uh, homeopathy. homeopathy, it's not uh, good results. So you have... <laughs> <laughs> It looks like the same, but it's not exactly the same. <laughs> so in oncology, the, the principle of similitude is very easy to find. You know, for instance, if you, have, if you abide by a crot crotalus, by, you have a great problem because uh, you have a thrombopenia. It's the same, kind, the same problem with chemotherapy. Some chemotherapy, you have thrombopenia, like uh, gemcitabine, for instance. So it's identical symptoms, you know. And if you can treat this, uh, this problem with uh, the laws of similitude with cotalus or ridus, and the patient will be better. And uh, thromb thrombopenia is in important because there is no commercial treatment for thrombopenia. So when your patient, when the, the platelets go down, you can give crotalus, and you will see that the platelets <laughs> grow very quickly. So this is, we have clinical guidelines for clinical symptoms related to the toxic effect of cancer treatment. And also, we'd li we, we know that we have to combine this with an individual homeopathic consultation treatment for also add uh, individual reaction to treatment and treat. We're between the two. <laughs> so the warnings is that the recommendations we publish do not intend to be limited or restrictive, but are informative that uh, we all discussed and following the principles of similitude and individualization, and the experience of the, the prescriber was of primary importance. So the levels of delusion and posology, because we were a different group of homeopaths of different clinic practice, we uh, decided and voted that it was uh, selected based on existing studies, e experts' experience. We agreed that we could uh, have equivalence rules between decimal dilutions and centimeter dilutions, and the number of pellets is not the most important factors. We each could respect our own uh, prescription habits. So now you, you have to tell me what is for you. It's a guess. The, <laughs> the best homeopath therapy, homeopathic therapy for the time of diagnostic disclosure. When somebody comes to you, I have a cancer. Which remedy do you, do you think, what is the recommendation? Aconite. Aconite. Constitutional? Constitutional. There are organ remedies. There are organ remedies. Oh, oh go on, remedies. No. We have to do a recommendation. Which recommendation you can give to everybody at the time no. of <laughs> diagnostic disclosure? So our society decided Sunday. no standard <laughs> because it's not possible. You are all different. <laughs> so if tomorrow I, I don't hope for you, but if some if tomorrow we'll say to you you have a cancer, your reaction will be your own reaction. So we can't give enyasia to everybody or staphylococcus to every, everybody. It's not possible. So maybe we'll go a little uh, short on the, the, the next. We had a few examples of our recommendations, so but the since... The recommendation for the oncologist is to say for the oncologist, if, so, if your patient have a problem, you, you have to address him to the homeopathic uh, doctor. So we have a few examples. 
And um, for uh, chemo therapy, so since we have running short of time, we'll go a little fast that, but the idea is that before chemo therapy, we have to do prevention because we don't know. So our first time prevention of nausea was, we decided together, Nux Vomica and Phosphorus. For the second line, on doit avancer. For the second line of prevention, this is when patients come back and, and despite the, the, the prevention treatment, had their nausea. We suggested Nux, Ipeka if Nux Vomica was not effective, Ignacia if there was anticipative nausea, and Colchico Motane if nausea was triggered by others. This we have more, we put into specific individual reaction of the patient. And for mucositis, you can give, of course, borax for simple mucositis, but if the mucositis is uh, more important, there is a very good uh, protocol, and we, find we have very good results with calium bichromicum and mercurius corrosivus. And um, astenia. Astenia, like we've shown, is the first, is the main symptom reported for the patients, and patients are <laughs> left alone with their fatigue. So we did recommendations. And this recommendation really works very well. This is, I, I, I could, uh, the, on my daily practice. So we have uh, um, um, acidum phosphoricum in highly di dilutions, increased dilutions, five days, every 10 days. And so whenever the patient is really feeling down, he says, now my fatigue is, is really more than the, my <coughs> usual fatigue. You give them them and give them a little boost to, f to keep on with treatment. For peripheral neuropathy prevention, in prevention, you have to give nervous, it's organotherapy, and phosphorus, and if you give oxaliplatin chemotherapy, you can give oxalic acid, oxalicum acidum. And here you see an advantage, because when you give that to like colon cancer, they don't stop the chemo. They could go up to their 12 uh, courses of chemotherapy, because we slow down the apparition of, of neuropathy, which might trigger the stop of the treatment. The problem with targeted therapy is folliculitis, you know, and uh, we have a good reaction with ristoxicodadron, arsolicum, iodatum. It's a good recommendation too. So all these recommendations you can find on the website of uh, ISCO, uh, of course. Of course, yes. <laughs> And regardless of the symptom, of course, you, because those are guidelines, sometimes we have in, insufficient uh, results, always an individual consultation is recommended. This is the publication, which you could, uh, it's on PubMed. And so what is the advantage of having those guidelines? It's like an uh, evidence-based medicine tool. It makes us more, um, it's easier to speak with us and with the oncologists because we have this tool, we have this publication. So it improves our communication, improves good practice in supportive cancer care. And of course, we think it could be applied to other clinical situations like pregnancy and delivery, like other diseases, that this kind of, of being homeopaths together and building the basis for our clinical practice. I think that in each specialty, perhaps you have to, to think to this kind of recommendation. Perhaps it's possible for some indications. So in conclusion. So ah. <laughs> Those recommendations, well, like you know, homeopathy is very safe. It's a non-toxic therapy without side effects, without drug interactions, which is a main issue during cancer treatment. It's affordable. And some clinical situations will require a specific homeopathic physician. So I want to say, to say you goodbye with my uh, oldest uh, patient. We say that she is okay to see a photo in the Congress. And uh, she had uh, mediastinal adenocarcinoma. And she had 115 chemotherapy. <laughs> she looks fine. And uh, it's... It's, uh, the cancer is here, just here, and she had never been weekly, and you see now, two years after, she, is, she feels fine, in better shape than her doctor. <laughs> <laughs>